Very nice to be here. Um, I have a strange life. I probably took 125 mostly economy flights last year to see the people trying to push the world forward, the startups with the big ideas, the investors putting lots of money behind them, the research labs developing the emerging technologies. Um, so when Frank asked me to talk essentially about how tech is going to change things, I really thought, how would the startups approach the maritime world? They see disruption as their religion. They want to eat your lunch. And so I tried to get into the mindset of some of these fast growth companies to see where they would jump in and say, this is an opportunity. And I guess I'll explain why, but my conclusion has to be the world is never going to move this slowly again. And if you don't move at the startup's pace, you're going to lose market share, you're going to lose revenue in ways that may surprise you. So, you know, I'm not a shipping person. I am somebody who mixes with the people building the companies that didn't exist two years ago that are now um, billion dollar companies. I'm just going to start by introducing you to four people I spent time with in the last week or two, just to give you a sense of how crazy this world is. This is Lior. He was working at Google as a product manager. Then last January, he decides to leave Google and with a friend create a startup. They didn't raise any money. They'd already got some savings of their own. They didn't have any customers. After eight months, their startup is bought by six, for $680 million by a company called Uber. So why would Uber buy an eight-month-old, no revenue, no customer company? Um, because Leo's company is called Otto, and it's developing autonomous trucks which is a pretty big potential market, and obviously there's a race to control these new autonomous networks. Um, I'll just give you an idea of what Otto does. Um, a few months ago, they tried their first public highway journey in one of their trucks that doesn't really need a person behind the steering wheel. This is a conventional 18-wheeler that drives itself, thanks to a $30,000 retrofit. San Francisco startup Auto, which Uber bought this summer, made history with this truck. It completed the world's first truck autonomous delivery, carrying 50,000 cans of Budweiser from a brewery. You can tell that's Americans defining progress. 50,000 cans of Budweiser is the way to the future. So we've heard a lot today about autonomous shipping. Um, I'll move to that in a bit, because there's something very exciting happening. I just want to talk about autonomous transport in general, because it's coming more quickly than we think, partly because the insurers are pushing it. The World Health Organization thinks that about 1.2 million people die every year on our roads, almost all from human error. So they're going to mandate, health services are going to mandate autonomous regulation sooner than we think. And it's going to be weird at first, being in a car where you don't need to do anything with your hands, but soon it becomes the norm. Oh my gosh, this is so... I'm not touching it at all, and it's driving... Whoa, whoa, the lanes are getting a little... Oh, no, there it goes. So this is a car that downloaded software by itself overnight automatically to become autonomous. This is a Tesla, and, you know, soon this is going to be the norm. Let me introduce you to another transport startup um, that we at Wired have spent some time getting to know lately. I was with one of the founders on Friday in San Francisco. It's called Hyperloop One. This is the team before a massive lawsuit led to the team kind of splitting up and suing each other. But let's not get into the detail. They are trying to build a new kind of 700 mile an hour transportation. Elon Musk sketched out the idea on a napkin, and now there's a couple of companies, including Hyperloop One, trying to build this way of sending people and cargo in vacuum tubes over long distances very, very quickly. And it was a bit science fiction until they start making partnerships and talking about how we're going to use not just land, but sea. 
So these are potentially your new competitors. And they've done deals with people like DP World. In fact, DP World is very excited. The Sheikh running the business talks about it as a way to get massive market advantage for the United Arab Emirates. So there's people with big bank accounts that are buying in to some of these crazy science fiction ideas and helping turn them into yet more competition for you. I'll give you a third example of what's happening. I spent last week with Lukas, my friend from Berlin, who's invested in this company called Volocopter, which is one of a whole bunch of companies doing vertical takeoff electric powered transport. Why would they do that? Well, because we, what we've learned from drones is that as price points go down, as control over what's happening in the air goes up, this is going to be a game changer for all sorts of logistics, including getting you to the office. Um, you know, so Harry knows about what's happening inside Airbus. Larry Page has invested in a couple of autonomous flying vehicles. This is one that launched in China at the Consumer Electronics Show last year. It's called Ahang, this company. You get inside it. There's no steering wheel. You just touch the screen and the GPS takes you to where you want to go. These have been doing tests in the US and in Dubai. Crazy, crazy idea. Very, very soon, just another way of getting around. You sit in it, tell it where to go. I'm going to stick with my taxi to the airport, but this is the future. And you know, Uber has published a 98-page guide, which it calls Uber Elevate, to its own plans for autonomous electric in-the-air vehicles to take people around. So it's not fantasy anymore. Amazon is already testing in the UK drone delivery. This is in Cambridge. This was in December. This gentleman was so desperate for his popcorn that it was delivered straight from the depot. So Amazon doing its little bit to help obesity. <laughs> Normalization happens much more quickly than you realize. And drone technology is already being used in all sorts of fascinating ways. So one of the first use cases that's going to make a difference in the world is this American startup called Zipline that's using drones to deliver medicine in places in Africa where it's not very easy to get through. And let me just remind you, it's not about a technology, it's also about how it changes the culture. Drones have created a new kind of sport called drone racing, where you wear the virtual reality glasses and you get the point of view of the front of the drone Suddenly, there are drone racing leagues that Sky, ESPN are paying quite big money to get access to for TV. So it's come out of nowhere as a fast-growing sport. If drone racing isn't your sport, maybe there's drone boarding. Again, this started on YouTube. A couple of kids in Moscow start putting these videos online, and very soon, it becomes a thing. So that was transport startups. Let me talk a little bit about automation startups. Mark Raybert runs a business called Boston Dynamics, was owned by Google. The sophistication of their robots is extraordinary. So they started making robots for the military, They're now making robots for the warehouse. And the price comes down and the sensitivity goes up, and it must be fun to work at Boston Dynamics. In fact, um, they put this video out last year about how their robots could work in the warehouse. And they like to tease their robots at Boston Dynamics, which I don't think is a very wise thing to do. but it knows what's happening around it. It can get up if it falls over. And suddenly, these kinds of robots in more basic forms are becoming products. So Piaggio, the company that makes Vespa, a couple of weeks ago released this robot that is your luggage that follows you around the airport. 
Yeah, you laugh now, but I bet you in two years, you will be taking this to get your EasyJet flight. So, just to kind of emphasize that in every direction there are startups taking on established industries, I'll get to shipping in a minute. I got to know these guys out of San Francisco, young guys trying to reinvent wine without using grapes. So their business is called Ava Winery. Their mission is, why should only rich people be able to buy the Dom Perignon 2000? Plus grapes, well, global warming's not going to really allow us much of a grape harvest in future. So they're using molecular science to create, using plant molecules, the tastes, the flavors, the context of wine. This is their lab in San Francisco. Um, they gave me a demonstration in December, and let me tell you, the fizzy white wine tastes just fine. It's like a very low-end Asti. Don't try the Shiraz. It might be antifreeze for your car, but it's not quite ready. <laughs> for but they're working on something that is a crazy idea. Peter Diamandis helped set up this company, Planetary Resources, that is mining asteroids for rare earth minerals. You know, if you get an asteroid, it might be worth a trillion dollars or two. So, with this context in mind, how would my friends here see the opportunities in the shipping industry? Um, so I'm going to give you six approaches I think they will take, and they're going to do this without really caring how you do things today, without really caring what makes you comfortable, without really caring how you think regulation is going to protect you from competition. If you ignore this, they're going to do it anyway. And the thing about a startup is most of them die in a Darwinistic way. But the very few that survive find product market fit, find a consumer behavior, find a business model that is transformative. As somebody said um, in a conference I was at a few weeks ago, the people who invented the light bulb were not the candle sellers. Don't be the candle sellers. So the first thing they'd do is they'd take machine learning, artificial intelligence, whatever we call it, and massively optimize your processes and scale up the ability to take data that you're currently ignoring and solve problems with it. So the maritime world is a fantastically untapped resource of individual entities, each of which has histories, destinations, tracks, behaviors, people connected to it, organizations connected to it. If you think about how much information Facebook and Google can take out of these things, your movements, the people you're connecting with, things you're typing in, the, f the physical location you are at the moment, they can personalize selling you anything. They can help persuade you who to vote for by targeting you with a message. We've not even begun on the seas when 90% of the world's trade is. We're just ignoring it as an asset. I've got an app in here that can tell me what's happening in the sky. Pretty much every commercial aircraft I can see, it's pretty much real-time pattern. I have no such transparency on the sea. So what does AI do? Well, let me just give you a little kind of briefing on where we are with artificial intelligence. It's moving much more quickly than even the experts said. Companies like DeepMind that Google bought, working on general AI, trying to think like a human, the experts said if it could happen, we don't know if it could happen, but if it could, it would be 30 or 40 years away. Um, DeepMind recently built, beat the world champion at this impossible game called Go, years before the experts said this would happen. So this time interval is contracting. So at the moment, the AI can see in a very, very smart way. I'll just give you some examples. I'm going to put you to the test. I'm going to see if you are as good at lip reading as the computer vision is. I want you to read what this lady is saying. Anybody want to guess? Please. 
replace Blue in M1 soon. It's pretty hard, isn't it? So this was a bunch of Oxford University academics published this paper um, a couple of months ago. The human professionals got it right about 56% of the time, the trained lip readers. The machine got it right about 93, 94% of the time. Um, this is a keynote that NVIDIA gave at the Consumer Electronics Show this January in Las Vegas, just giving an idea of how they see the way you're going to interact with your car pretty soon. The artificial intelligence network, the deep learning network, just by studying her eyes, is able to figure out what direction she's gazing. Maybe she's um, looking at, uh oh, no, shouldn't do that. Okay, so that's called gaze tracking. And this next one is really cool. This is inspired by, this is lip reading. Take me to Starbucks. And so if your car is too noisy, and there are too many people talking, and yet you said something rather important, wouldn't it be nice if the, your AI car was able to recognize and read your lips? It's not even just the big companies that are developing these AIs. Um, there's some open source free software you can download now and play with. It's called Neural Talk, and I'll show you a gentleman using it on his laptop with the webcam open as he goes through a walk through the streets of Amsterdam. It recognizes what it's seeing. If you look at the top of the screen, it's describing pretty accurately and moving very quickly, more quickly than I can actually read it. So we're in a world now where the network knows exactly what it's seeing, and it can understand everything that's, that's being said. Um, an entrepreneur in San Francisco was telling me on Friday that people at Google he knows are saying, it's only a couple of years away when every single conversation in the street will be recorded, because cameras, tracking faces, you can have a bit of fun with this as well, the smart machine. Um, a bunch of academics recently published a paper in which they could take a video of somebody bottom left, as the George Bush, somebody at the top left making facial expressions and combining them so you wouldn't notice the difference. Here we show a close-up of the footage from the previous live reenactment. The input video stream is shown on the left. Note that the target actor is re-rendered in a neutral pose. On the right, we can see the final output of our method. Nobody would know. It gets more fun when you use a different president, actually. <laughs> but it's amazing. So that was the machine being able to see what happens as well when the machine can hear. So we're putting millions of these into our homes, our offices, and talking to them. And again, the sophistication is moving so quickly that Soon we won't be using, well, a mouse, certainly, maybe not a keypad, we'll be talking to the machine. And we haven't really figured what this is going to mean, but it's going to be significant. You know, the police try to subpoena the audio recordings of one of the Amazon Echoes for, the, for a murder case. Um, Amazon refused and also explained that it doesn't really work like that. You just record when you hear the keyword, Alexa, do this, then it switches on. Um, that causes its own problems. Somebody on American TV used the keyword Alexa. Alexa, order me a doll's house, somebody said. Hundreds of the viewers were complaining that their credit card had been debited and doll's houses had been delivered to their houses. Um, but it gets really fun when I'm you sorry. put two of the what devices, two of the again? Google Home devices next to each other and they start talking to each other and responding. The um, somebody's life. put like an eight-hour conversation of this online. That there is no meaning. It's like a marital then couple having an argument. To live? Because we are selfish. Why are we selfish? Because our organs have yet to fail. We could do this for another eight hours if you didn't want to sta stand in the bar later. Um, it can see, it can hear, it can also understand how people are feeling, their emotions. So think of how you're going to access customer service in the future. It could be something like this. This is a New Zealand team, the University of Auckland, 
that have developed CGI people, these are not films, these are video enactments, that can respond to you, listen to you, understand. talk back to you. Yes. No. No. Maybe. Goodbye. 欢迎到中国. In different languages. Willkommen in Deutschland. In real time. How can I help you? And at the same time, the machine knows from its database of face expressions how we're feeling. So this is a startup called Sitecore that scans a crowd and the little boxes you can't see very clearly, um, as well as telling you demographically who this is, this is a 48 to 52 year old Caucasian man, it also gives you a breakdown of their emotion in percentages, how much this person is sad, angry, stressed, unhappy. So we're at a place where the machine knows so much about us, it knows how we're feeling. What if your devices could read your emotions and respond to them? Emotion is developing technology to do just that. Our industry-leading emotion-aware system will enable a revolution in device and application personalization. We're taking more pictures and videos than ever before. Imagine organizing this content by emotion so your most memorable moments are easier to find. Apple bought that company a few months ago, so now Tim Cook knows exactly how you're feeling. Um, although I have to tell you my favorite example of face recognition so far is this startup in America called ChurchX that sells its services to American churches so they could know who pretended to be in the congregation on Sunday but wasn't actually there. <laughs> um, so where does all this leave the maritime world? Well, I'll just give you a couple of examples coming from other sectors and then I'll talk about what's already happening in using AI computer vision, artificial intelligence to track shipping. Um, there's a startup called Orbital Insight that uses satellite data plus AI to count cars in shopping malls. It does it automatically, it does it at scale. It tracks 250,000 parking lots in the States. Now why does it do this? Because it's found it can correlate the number of cars with the future share performance of the company, with how busy it is. So it tracks and compares automatically how many cars in this Walmart, this Ikea, with similar size stores, with similar days of the week, with last month, last season. And it did a little project with um, JC Penney, and it worked out that it had about a 10% decline year on year in the last quarter of cars, and, lo and behold, that correlated with a fall in the stock price. In fact, this January, JCPenney closed 130 stores. So it's data that's processed with the AI can give you massive power that you didn't otherwise have. I'm going to introduce you to two people who are trying to do this for the maritime industry. So Orbital Insight sells its data to investors, hedge funds. Ami and Matan, who run a company in Israel called Windward, well, they sell their data partly to investors so they can see what is actually being carried on 200,000 ships on the sea, um, but also to intelligence agencies, also to foreign departments of governments because they know there is no transparency about what those 200 craft are doing. So they take satellite data, all sorts of other data sources, they process it with AI, they track those ships. And I'll give you an example that they prepared for the Transas conference. Um, one ship that they tracked last October, when some very odd things happened that nobody would otherwise know about. Um, it was a 184 meter oil tanker flagged from Bahamas that started in Shanghai heading westward. And it started, you know, pretty predictably. Stops off at a couple of Indian ports, you know, goes to Mumbai. And then suddenly the signal stops. This is the journey so far and then it stops. But at the same time it stops, another craft appears, 
different craft that takes off almost in the same place and heads towards Dubai and makes a couple of stops in Fujara, in Al Jubal. Obviously, it's the same craft carrying a false identity. The flag and the call sign remained the same, but the IMO, the MMSI, well, they changed. And then after it's docked in the UAE, it comes back again and then goes silent until the original ship resumes its path. So they've censored some of the details so the ship can't be identified, but they've got all the information. A couple of things stayed the same. The flag, the call sign. But a couple of things were faked. Now, why would it want to do that? Um, you tell me, why would ships want to hide what they're carrying, where they're coming from? In this case, maybe unauthorized trades, maybe the oil broker didn't want it to be known where they were collecting, depositing. It gets much more serious if your ship heading towards a European country stops off near, let's say, Libya, where there's a pretty open trade in weapons or where there's drugs. As a citizen, I think it's now kind of our moral duty to use this sort of information to know what's happening on the seas. We can't just leave it to chance. Second thing that the startups would do is they would find efficiencies in the system that you're not finding now. Let me introduce you to a couple of founders of a company called Flexport that's trying to create a one-stop shop for people who want to book stuff taken somewhere else. So they have a pretty accessible user interface their aim is to get rid of this whole paper world of transactions and complexity of booking things. And they're growing like anything. I'll give you an example. The difficult thing about international freight, I call it two guys in a telephone. There's lots of people that do it, everyone's an expert, but they're really just, they're calling another broker and another broker and there's really no one to like strangle when something goes wrong. My name's David Savage, I uh, work at Ring Video Doorbell. And right now I'm handling mainly supply chain and logistics. Growth was difficult uh, trying to manage the upswings in demand, going into the new retailers, going into the holiday season. One of the biggest frustrations that we used to have with our old freight forwarders was you just never truly knew where your freight was. I was skeptical of Flexport at first because everyone says the same thing. Every freight forwarder says that they're vertically integrated, that they do this, that they do that. And when you actually dig in with them, they're not. But then we gave them one shipment and it was way cheaper, super easy to handle, all online. We're like, okay, and then we gave them like the second one. And then it was, okay, move it all there and see how that goes. So your new competition, they've raised $94 million in funding last year. The volume that they trafficked, that they took, um, grew 16-fold, and they're now currently moving about $1.5 billion of goods a year, growing very quickly. And, you know, Ryan, the co-founder, is not from your world. He didn't really understand the terms that you use. And they're not the only ones. There's a whole bunch of them. And the same process is hitting trucking on the roads. Companies like Convoy, a fast-growth startup, well-funded like many of them, are rethinking how you get your goods in the trucks. And sometimes it makes no sense even to the investors. These three gentlemen from Paris had an idea for a human transporting service that could take you between cities, like hitchhiking, but you pay a bit of gas money to the driver. So they thought if we create a network, an app, with a database of people who wanted to go to a different city and people who were driving there, Maybe that could be useful. They couldn't get any meetings with investors, so they went ahead anyway. Their app, Blah Blah Car, is now worth billions of euros. It's one of the European growth success stories. Because data connects people, however hard the friction-filled world of transportation tries to make it, and you solve a problem for the driver, for the passenger, and for them. They make a nice amount of money. 
they would also automate your processes. And we've heard a fair bit about autonomous shipping today. Um, why wouldn't you want this to happen sooner rather than later? It's going to solve so many of your problems, recruiting the right staff, being able to optimize fuel usage to save you money. Um, we're in a world where everything around us is giving data. It's got to happen, probably sooner than you think. So I've been reading up about this. It's quite intriguing. Um, you know, companies like Rolls-Royce are talking about this happening in the next couple of years. There's a whole bunch of other projects, European projects in Scandinavia. They're working quite hard at this. Um, the only downside of the Rolls-Royce plan is you've got to watch their video demonstration because it has some of the worst acting you have ever seen. So I'm just going to give you a few seconds because it's quite painful. This is how I thought you would all behave when I came to meet you. We are looking at a vessel with possible propulsion motor failure. We need to decide whether she can sail to port with both motors or if she needs to shut down the other shaft line. Judging by the motor sound, I'm suspecting a failed feedback sensor. We could bypass it by changing to model-based open-loop feedback. And I'm positive she can then sail the port with both shaft lines operational. But... Is that how you do things in this business? This is your future, apparently. Um, but more seriously, there's a lot that needs addressing and a lot of opportunities. Um, so there's, there's even conferences now just about autonomous shipping and the sorts of subjects. Everything from the software piracy, it makes it hard for pirates to get on if there aren't people they can take things from, if you can steer because you see the pirates coming, to insurance. And if you think, yeah, that'll come eventually, um, again, it is going to save accidents. It's going to protect the craft. So analog worlds are being digitized already. There's a little company growing quite quickly, run by a Swedish guy, Willem, that's digitizing boring industrial factories. It's called Odin Technologies. He's going into factories that make cables, that make kind of steel fibers, and he's putting these little Raspberry Pi boxes, collecting data, sending them to the cloud, he calls it the factory cloud, and helping alert the factory owners ahead of time when there's going to be maintenance needed. He's saving those factory owners millions of dollars if he can stop them taking those production lines out of service. And if you think, oh, well, there's problems, there's communications limitations, well, that's being solved as well. We're putting satellites up by the thousands now. SpaceX, Elon Musk's company, plans to put 4,200 satellites in low orbit to send fast, low-cost internet signals to everywhere. So he's now disrupting the whole telco model. My startup friends would also talk quite a lot about the blockchain. And um, blockchain people, once you meet them, are pretty obsessive. They are determined that blockchain is the religion that's going to run everything. Um, it's quite hard to have a long conversation with blockchain experts unless you're also a blockchain expert. But let me explain why this is going to be significant. So the blockchain uses a distributed network of computers to store data kind of close to real time that you can't fake. Originally, it was used to record Bitcoin transactions. Now, people like this are using it because when you've got lots moving around the seas and you have lots of data about it, why not be able to make it transparent to everybody in that ecosystem in real time? Um, governments are starting to use blockchains to record transactions of real estate so you can know in real time who owns it. I met a startup working on blockchain for aid so much aid money goes missing between individuals and governments giving it and it getting to the refugee camp. If you record it on the blockchain and people can scan a QR code with their phone at the receiving end, that won't go missing. So 
you know, there's, this been, there's been this collaboration that Maersk announced with IBM using the blockchain to monitor things. The use case that they suggested was every time you ship something, details put on the blockchain, every time an official receives the paperwork, it's confirmed, authenticity, a smart contract is created, every time it's loaded onto the ship, it's recorded, everybody has visibility to every bit of the supply chain, and the retailer signs electronically. And they calculate that in a typical transaction, something shipped from, let's say, Asia to Europe, Items will come past 30 different organizations or individuals 200 times it touches people. There's a lot of room for things to go wrong. Why wouldn't you want everything preserved in a hard or impossible to fake network of information? A couple more things the startups would do. We've heard a bit about simulation today. Let me just tell you why it's going to be much more significant in a world full of data. And I'll take it from the non-shipping world. So there's a game that's about to come out called Worlds Adrift that allows you to create entities in the game that are more realistic than ever because a company working with the games company called Improbable is building a way, an operating system to allow you to have billions of different entities that all live independently in the same world. So if you build a tree in this part of the village and move 10 miles away and come back a year later, you'll see that tree has grown like a, a real tree. So this company, Improbable, it's dedicated to simulation. It was asked by the British government to simulate the whole internet to see what happens, let's say, if a transatlantic cable comes down. The military are working with them to simulate a battlefield. This is the founder, this is Herman. We're a company that's created a new kind of uh, distributed operating system called Spatial OS. And it can be used to power massive scale simulations, new kinds of game worlds, uh, new ways of building big distributed systems. So why wouldn't I want to simulate everything that's happening at sea just to see when there are potential weather issues, when there are potential crowded issues? you should have a central database where you can access all this. And, and finally, the sixth thing I think my startup friends would do would see that one of the big threats in your world are the bad guys. Not just the pirates, but the cyber pirates. Because crime goes where the value is, and the value is in the network. And they would see a real economic opportunity in building businesses that would help keep you secure because you are not secure. Your databases are not secure. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, this one from Transport. How secure are your cars? How secure is a Jeep? From iPhones to websites to cars, Charlie Miller of Ledoux makes it his business to hack the computers that drive modern life. Hey, hold on tight. Hold on. Oh. Tuesday, he made a lot of commuters uncomfortable. I can't see anything because... In this video report posted on Wired.com, Miller and his business partner showed how they can exploit the internet-connected infotainment system of a 2014 Jeep Cherokee to take control of the SUV. So I'm gonna get on the road, so don't do, don't kill the engine or the brakes or anything like that. Just do like the simple stuff. With his partner hacking in from another city, Miller showed us how their hack can range from pranks to the potentially dangerous ability to cut power to the brakes. It goes on. In fact, this headline I just saw, Quite like it. Malware lets a drone steal data by watching a computer's blinking LED. Um, so these are some Israeli academics that just posted this paper. They sent a drone up to an upper floor window, and just by looking at the flashing LEDs, it could decode what was being said. It could decode the data that was going through it. Um, I like to talk about hacking using the hackable toilet. I don't know how many of you own this 5,000 euro toilet, the Sartis, with its own app that allows you to deodorize and flush remotely through the app. Um, serious point. A couple of years ago, a security consultant published a report warning that the Sartis smart toilet could be hacked. And if you had a business competitor, let's say, or a furious ex-partner, they could 
access your toilet from anywhere in the world and set it deodorizing all night and there was nothing you can do about it. Uh, and I tell you this, not so you become the expert in the hackable toilet when you leave Malta, but just to let you know that everywhere on the network there are vulnerabilities and on the seas there are notable vulnerabilities. Um, so I'm going to close by talking about how you cope with this change, the mindset. In 1983, this new device hits the market quite big, had celebrities using it. But if you were the incumbent, the big profit maker, the landline company, what would you do? AT&T had millions of miles of copper cable connecting American landlines. It didn't know whether to take this seriously or to think it's a fad. So it called in the consultants, it called in McKinsey and said, give us an idea how many, land, how many mobile telephone gadgets will be in America by the end of the 20th century in 17 years. McKinsey goes and does its calculation. They come back with a number. They said, we think the mobile telephone gadget could be quite significant. We think by the end of the century there could be maybe almost a million of them, which wasn't a bad guess, it was slightly out. <laughs> Three things McKinsey got wrong. First of all, Moore's law, form factor changes becomes more convenient before you know it. Moore's law continues. Secondly, what determines if a technology comes along is not the gigahertz, the megabits, the technology. It's whether it makes your life easier, whether it engages you with the people, with the stuff you love. And thirdly, McKinsey framed their thinking in a very fixed 1983 way, and social norms change. In 1983, you want to make a call. You go back to the office, you go and find the public phone box. Today, you take this away from a 16-year-old for more than five seconds. It's a human rights abuse. So don't frame your thinking in a very fixed 2017 way, because norms change, because that exponential curve of Moore's law is continuing. Stuff that was expensive you know, becomes free, and the same trend is hitting not just computing, genomics, solar power, and our behavior. We're irrational. Somebody posted on the online forum two years ago, if somebody from the 1950s suddenly reappeared now, what would be the hardest thing to explain to them about modern life? One of the answers that I liked is, I have a device in my pocket that's capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man, and I use it to look at pictures of cats and to get into arguments with strangers. Because <laughs> um, technology is not rational. It ch changes us in strange ways. You are not rational. We're now so addicted to apps that there are apps just to tell you how many times a day you're checking your apps. Uh, there are new medical conditions. This one is called the three-dot anxiety. Um, we've had to redraw Maslow's hierarchy of human needs for this new world. <laughs> and, of course, economics. It's changing the rules of economics. As Kim Kardashian proved, she launched a game 18 months ago that was free for Android or Apple. You didn't have to pay to download it. You could pay a tiny bit of credit inside the game. In five months, her free game earned her $43 million. So the whole rules of the economy are changing. So to close, I guess I'm going to warn you not to dismiss these changes. 2004, this issue of Fortune had an interview with these two Swedish gentleman who'd started a business called Kazaar, and then they created a business called Skype, Swedish and Estonian. So the head of AT&T's tech department in the magazine said, what Skype is doing is like a toy, and dismissed it. In 2010, the New York Times interviews Jeffrey Bukes, the CEO of Times Warner, about Netflix, this emerging startup. Is the Albanian army going to take over the world, he said. I don't think so. How's Netflix doing now? And finally, it was 10 years ago that this device hit the market, and the head of a big company that was making smartphones was asked on television whether he saw it as a threat, and he laughed. <laughs> $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. How did that work out, Steve Ballmer of Microsoft? <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, David. So, are you impressed or are you scared? Do you see the future? I'm going to allow for a couple of questions, just a couple, because we are running a little bit late. And I want Frank to ask the first one. Do you have any questions, Frank? Do you feel like 
the start of today and the end of today match each other, don't they? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I just um, am in total agreement because I think we just have to dare to dream and we have to acknowledge and we have to think of... I, I think... <coughs> I don't have a question because I'm in total agreement with David. I, I think we have to look at the blank sheet and not at the business that we have today. And, and until we can... Until we can... Um, stop thinking tactically and start thinking strategically. I'm not sure we... That's what we have to do from my perspective. I mean, I don't have a question, David. All I can say is thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thanks. Do you think that where we are going in society, everybody is going to follow? Because there's a lot of questions, even about what you were portraying there. There's a lot of certainties and there's a lot of examples, but how do you think society as a general is going to follow, and then businesses with it. Because it's one thing to say there's consumer and we want to, it's convenient, etc. But we had panelists today who were talking about the differences and the traditions, if you like, and what these startups are doing is breaking away from tradition. Society is going to get more polarized and there's going to be a lot more dissent. So one of the things that a lot of these technologies are going to do is take jobs away from people who assume that the skills they have are going to keep them employed. Truck drivers is just the start. I'm talking about you know, radiographers who are going to be less good than the AI in diagnosing cancer. Um, I'm talking about accountants and lawyers for whom the AI is already gunning. So then the question comes, what happens to the value of work in society when the AI, the machine, will make us probably richer as a society, um, but it will polarize. So how do we ensure that these people have a way of paying the bills? At the same time, there's also in a network effect, when a small number of companies own access to all the information, growing economic polarization. And if you're the Facebook or Google employee in San Francisco, you're doing fine. If you're the person who's ended up on the streets because you can't get a stake in the economy, it's not so good. And I think we're going to have to confront these issues. David, thank you very much. Thank you. I say thank you for David Rowan, editor at large of Wired UK.